has done is ask questions that you're probably not going to hear in any other forums or by anyone else. Questions that we, we actually asked that were open to interpretation and likely took the candidates in a direction that they may not have thought of before becoming candidates. And it's okay to not have all of the answers. What we are looking for is the principles and the values behind your responses. And these, these are the guiding principles that are going to be a huge part of your decision making as council members. And finally, by sheer virtue of your participation in this process, shows a true willingness to engage with all stakeholders in our community. Whereas some candidates who are not here seem to be disinterested in the issues of working people. We will endeavor to support the candidates that best share our values in this election, but we also consider this process the beginning of an ongoing conversation and information sharing with those who are successful. So let's get started. Tonight, we will ask two questions over the next hour. The order of responses was going to be random, but we're going to be using a central mic. And in order to do that, people need to be prepared to get to the mic as soon as possible. So we're actually going to start, sorry, John, here. <laughs> and we're going to go all the way over to Stu, and to John, and then back over to Joe. And then we'll do the, the opposite on the second question. Each of you can exercise the right to challenge or comment on another candidate's response by raising your card. You have a pink card, mine's orange. But nonetheless, you have a pink card, and you can challenge anyone at any time. The question or comment is limited to 30 seconds, and the respondent has one minute. I only ask that you wait for me to acknowledge you before you start. And then we'll wrap up closing comments by each of the candidates for just one minute. This process, you know, we'll go until it's complete, uh, but we're shooting for about 8.30. I ask that there's no heckling. Uh, part of what we do in labor is we take bullying and harassment very seriously. Uh, so no heckling. But by all means, cheer for your favorite candidate if you feel the need. All right. So starting with John, we're going to open up the questions now. Number one. A living wage is an hourly wage a family of four requires for basic necessities such as housing, food, child care, and it's based on the cost of living in their community. A living wage is a bare bones calculation. It does not cover additional expenses such as debt, savings for retirement or children's post-secondary education, home ownership, or emergency expenses. The Camelson District Labor Council has worked closely with the living wages for families on doing the calculations for Kamloops in hopes that someday our city would join the sweeping movement of cities implementing living wage ordinances across North America, from New York to Quinnell. Our question to you, do you support a living wage for all working people so they are lifted out of poverty, be empowered by their economic gains, decrease their likelihood of exploitation, and can more easily become fully equal participants in our society? And would you be a champion on city council to have Kamloops added to the growing list of cities who support this important socioeconomic initiative? Thanks. That's very sensible. Mic, please, sir. Um, can I make one shout out first, oh, sure. if possible, to Sadie Hunter that would have been here tonight if she didn't have a medical appointment in Vancouver? just to be sure. Um, as for a living wage, my timer can start now. Uh, I'm a father of three under 10, and my wife's a carry that can't afford to send to work because daycare is too expensive. Uh, I have worked for minimum wage many, many years. Back when it was under $6, and even when it was as low as 10. So I absolutely, as a proud Canadian, support being an advocate for a living wage and as to those that say it's a danger to the economy, those seem to be the ones on top, and there's a lot more below that fully support it, and I'd like to find a way to make it work. John. <laughs> Um, I support 
support a living wage for people that are working for organizations of a certain size. However, I think that if a mom and pop organization has a couple of students that are working for their store or for their small business, and the cost uh, that it would accrue to the business owner to provide a living wage to uh, two employees means that they have to fire people in order to have one person that is better remunerated, I think that's a dangerous thing. Um, we, we have this tension between supporting small businesses who really helps drive our economy forward and supporting the workers who are, are the fuel for, for the engine of the Canadian economy. And so a living wage for people working for an organization that is of a certain size, I absolutely agree with. But I think the small businesses um, need to be given some leeway so that they can stay open and support their own standard of living. Thank you. Thank you, and I never thought I'd be one to put up a challenge card with all due respect. But uh, so I challenge, though, uh, living wage to be even in the mom and pop organizations. Uh, yes, they'll be putting out more, but this gives back to their economy and their very own business. So we would all benefit from a living wage. Thank you. When they come up, please announce their name. That's an excellent idea. We don't recognize it. Yeah. Myanmar. Thank, Thank you. you. Name a local sister. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. Jesse. Hi, everyone. Jesse Um So, as a person who has had to reach out to employment services like the Open Door Group, I understand the basis of a living wage. I understand the basis of needing work and needing stability. Uh, in the economy and the basis of poverty that we live in right now, a living wage gives stability, it gives security, and people can latch onto their mental health and be able to handle it better, and so it provides that benefit. Uh, as far as it goes, as I have said, with reaching out to the Open Door Group, with those opportunities within Work BC, there is an opportunity to have wage subsidies for workers who are either lacking in hours or are trying to get on, or who are on the high. So there's no, it's not out of the realm of possibility to work on wage subsidies for the people who own businesses who are saying, well, maybe it may not be beneficial to me. So there's always a solution to the problem. As far as a living wage goes, I fully support it. There is absolutely no um, excuses to deny people for the opportunity to have stability, to have uh, the ability to put food on the table, to be able to live, and to be able to support themselves and their families. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bill Sarai. And yes, it's, it's true, a living wage, I totally support it. But before we get the living wage, we need to pick up the minimum wage. I was disappointed with the NDP government that just got elected. They promised us that the minimum wage would be one of their first things they would do, and now they put it off till 2019. By 2019, the minimum wage is going to be even further down. So now you've made a bigger gap to a living wage. What I propose we should be doing starting right now is not hurt the businesses that are paying you by implementing a living wage or a three dollar raise right away, but how about 50 cents a year just to bring them up up to a, a decent wage by 2019. The way they're looking at it now, by the time they reach 2019, for a minimum wage increase, we're going to be that much further behind. People deserve to live in a in a society where they feel that the roof over their head and there's food in their fridge, the bills are paid, but they also need to know that they can send their children to school or university to better their life than what they've been struggling with. So a living wage is totally um, on my radar, and I think Campbell's to take the lead and say, look, as we get prosperous, let's show how it can be done. I didn't give Brad an opportunity to respond to the challenge, and that's my, my bad. Was that a challenge? Uh, it seemed like a point. It was a point. Okay. Yep. Yeah, you're good to, to move along. Okay. okay, very good then. All right. Yeah. Nancy. Hi, I'm Nancy Beppel, and I'm running for City Council. I first want to commend the Camelops District Labor Council. I know that uh, over the last year or so, um, they've been working with some of the current council to try to bring forward 
ideas about a living wage. And it's really important when you want to have change in council that community groups bring forward ideas. Um, and that's something that I would support definitely. Uh, New Westminster was one of the first communities in BC that has adopted a living wage. Uh, it doesn't usually affect the, the members, the QP members that work for the city. It's more for all of the contractors. So the, maybe the exercise people that come in or the, uh, the people that work as uh, extra janitorial. Uh, if the QP members can be paid a decent wage, then the city can afford to pay the people that they hire on contract a decent wage as well. I would welcome KDLC to come forward again and work with myself or some other people on council to make it to move move the issue forward. So thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Kathy Sinclair, and I'm running for City Council. Um, first off, I just wanted to say I am here because of unions. My father worked for BC Tel um, and raised a family of four in that. And uh, my maternal grandfather was a school custodian, and my uh, paternal grandfather worked for BC Ferries. So, um, a living wage, hugely important, and absolutely, I think it's uh, crucial to work towards. Um, full disclosure, my reality is I work for a not-for-profit, and I fundraise, and it can be very difficult to meet budget, but. A living wage is something that I personally do strive for in my own organization, and I think it's something that we should be striving for in Cambridge as well. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Leslie Lax, and I'm running for council. Absolutely, the living wage is something that we should all aspire to and something that we should work towards. I've trained as an economist. I've worked as an economist for 20 years. I can understand the throughput that we get when we raise incomes. When you raise incomes, we raise disposable income, we grow the entire economy, and we allow families to support themselves and their kids and look to the future and the gen for future generations. With respect to city council, absolutely. If I were elected to council, I'd, very work, I'd work very closely with labor organizations and others on council to see how we might be able to institute a living wage within the city of Kamloops, recognizing that sometimes these things take a little time, it may not happen overnight, but we certainly want, we wouldn't want to see it happen over 20 years even. Thank you. that management 
and employers do not have an exclusive franchise over the moral and the, the right position on things. And as an arbitrator, a former arbitrator, I say to you, it's time to be fair. It's time to treat people with respect. And it's time to basically go back and live by the law. Uh, Christy Clark learned that lesson the hard way. Uh, I think we need to move that boundary forward. So I say, go for it. We have to focus on what we can do as city council. What we can do as city council is pay the people that we hire a living wage, and we can also lead by example. We can't, in and of ourselves, change the minimum wage in Victoria. So I think the place to start is around the city council table and make the change there. Um, that's all I have to say. We're not debating BC provincial politics here. Jim, did you want to respond? Municipal governments are a creature of the provincial government. Basically, uh, we disempower ourselves when we say we cannot advocate to the provincial government. So I, I say to you, you know, everyone in this room knows what it's like to advocate on behalf of members, and we can apply that same pressure and that same influence with John Morgan that we can apply within this room and with employers in this community. So I say, you know what? I ain't respecting the boundaries at this point. I'm going after 15 bucks in the next year. Hi everybody, I'm Mike McKenzie. I'm running for Mayor of Kamloops. The reason why I'm standing in front of you here today is basically because as a young person, a young professional over the past few years, I've seen that things just aren't working. Things just aren't working for our younger class especially, and they're not working for our older class. So when I think about what this question means to me, I don't even, like the voices in, like the people have spoken and we've been talking about this issue for some time now. And we have pushed people into where we're at today long ago when we needed to push farther. Like I'm looking towards the future and I look at all the people that are behind me, they're all running for council. And so who's the voice that's gonna support the voices in the city? I'm running for mayor because I wanna be that voice and I wanna be that individual. I've had about 10 years in experience. I started with fire departments, I was a fire chief, and I got the opportunity to make quick decisions in that moment and on the spot and over that time in my career. And then I moved into politics. I've been in politics now for seven years, and I've really, my experience over the past few years has been bringing people together. So what needs to happen is I believe that we need a mayor in Catholics who's able to articulate the issues, who's able to listen well, and who's able to bring these voices to the table. Small in stature, but large in presence. <laughs> My name is Ray Dollywall, I'm a half candidate for City Council. Um, I do support a living wage, but I think we can do better than a living wage. I change a lot of locks for a lot of people, a lot of uh, young families, their spouses have all gone north to work to, to make a living so that their families can stay here and live in this beautiful city, beautiful city we have. So a uh, living wage is... Uh, Preferably the parade. But uh, yes, I, I definitely believe we can do better than 15 as well. Uh, being a sole proprietor, I always have all, been all my life, uh, both the jobs I've ever had, uh, both are 50 and 35 years respective and still running to this day. Um, I am in the process of buying a new business, I will have staff then, I know I'll be paying better than the the uh, living wage because I like to see people thrive. When they thrive, I thrive means I've done my job. I'm a little bit older than some of you and making up with some of you, but uh, so I've made my made my living in this town. It's been a great, great city and I know we can do better. So thank you. I'm looking for a 
challenge card of someone who can make, differentiate between the minimum wage and the living wage. Hopefully that's where we belong. Yeah. Oh, yes, <laughs> My name is Jan Marr. Uh, I am running for city council. Uh, I'm a huge proponent of living wage. I believe it's, and I don't quote me on this, but I believe it is higher than 15 uh, here in Kamloops. But uh, we're all interconnected, and what we earn affects everyone around us, whether we uh, been lucky enough to be born into a home that families can support us and we're not homeless, uh, or whether we're being, we've been struggling without a home, or whether we earn a lot of money. Uh, we're all interconnected and it affects us all how much we earn. Um, I'll be very quick here. Uh, just personal experience, I was a single mom at 17 and I was lucky enough to have a family that I never did have to go to the food bank, but it was very close. And if I had a living wage to be earned, it would be a different story. And it would have been a much smoother path, but no complaints for me. And I'm grateful to be here. Thank you.
night was too late anyway. The deadline was Tuesday night.
the living wage. I think that people deserve to be paid what their labor is worth. I listened to a guy like Bill, who's been an employer for many years, and I really respect what he says. My own son is a very successful businessman in town. He says he would be ashamed to only pay minimum wage, and I think people should be paid what their labor is worth. I'm a graduate student at the TRU, and I'm majoring in business right now, so I've been looking how a minimum wage will impact the business's bottom line, and the answer is five cents for a cup of coffee is not a lot extra out of any of our pockets. So absolutely, I support a living wage, but as we do that, we can't allow it to remain stagnant. It has to be updated every few years. We can't say, okay, this is the living wage, and okay, we're there, we're good. Let's all pat ourselves on the back and go home. It constantly has to be reevaluated. And one of the things we can do to make the living wage uh, more livable is we can look at housing initiatives, we can look at bringing down the cost of living here in Kamloops. Um, I think a multi-pronged approach to affordability, including the living wage, is the best way to go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I totally support a living wage. I actually pay uh, my staff more than a living wage. Uh, I think that's just a respect issue. Um, and just to, to get up why I didn't get my questionnaire, I actually was the chair of the RCMP Music Ride, which we just hosted two weeks ago. I was kind of busy. Uh, we had 5,000 people enjoy a wonderful event in our town with our Rotary Club that came together. Uh, and it looks like we've raised a lot of money to make our community a little stronger for all those that need it. So there's my excuse. I thank you for the opportunity. I just sent a whole bunch of tweets, more than I probably ever sent in my life, uh, to get my message out. So I appreciate this opportunity. My, uh, my family has a history in the labor union. Uh, my father was a shop steward, my mom was a shop steward. My grandfather, who came from Russia in 1925, uh, joined the Carpenters Union, helped build uh, a lot of the infrastructure we use in Vancouver. Um, I know the value of workers. I also know the value of pride in your work, and most union people and most union and the employees take pride in the work. I think we all see the opportunity to give somebody a higher wage, but it comes from both sides. If you work together, and as a city council, you work at other things, as Ashley alluded to, to lowering the cost of living in community. So that's the role in, in city council is we work together, we all win together, we're all better off. So there's my comment. Thank you. Right. So we reset the clock, everybody. Your challenge cards are reactivated. Question number two. Oh, snap. <laughs> <laughs> challenge cards for each question? <laughs> And it's up to you if you want to use it. One thing I know that all candidates can agree on is that we need a strong, convenient recycling program in our city. And the blue bin system has made a huge difference to our landfills and to our environmental footprint. In 2015, the workers at the contracted recycling plant in Tura went on a strike with the sole goal of lifting wages above the average $13 an hour that most were getting. Many of the workers worked two or more jobs, and many needed to access the food bank in order to feed their children. Meanwhile, Emtera was boasting substantive and ever-increasing profits. As you remember, the citizens of Kamloops became extremely frustrated with the lack of service and the inaction as they saw it by city council, to the point of calling for the dumping of their recycling on the steps of city hall. They were angry at having to stockpile recyclables, which some were concerned about being a fire hazard and others about being pest attractants. Many reverted back to throwing recyclables into the trash, and all were very angry that they were continuing to pay for a service that they were not getting. What is particularly notable during that time, though, is that even though they were angry, the majority of people that I talked to were overwhelmingly supportive of the workers getting a fair wage for the dirty, dangerous, and necessary work that they do. This is a single example of how privatized municipal services removes the control by city over the working conditions, the health and safety standards, and the quality of services that they are supposed to be providing tax and fee paying citizens of our city. Our question to you, do you support the contracting out of municipal services why, when, or why not? Starting with Bill. <laughs> so, 
Um, privatization does not belong in government. Uh, one of the key reasons for that is if you look at government services, they're not done uh, for a profit. They're done because you need a particular service. As soon as we, as soon as we look at privatization and bring in a corporation, uh, or let me just back up for a second, government stakeholders are the people. On the private side, uh, it's just simply shareholders. And there's a mandate on the private sector to make a profit. Therefore, they either have to get paid more or the government has to subsidize it if, they're, if, they're private, if the government is privatizing the service. So why, why do it? Uh, I just never quite understood that there are two separate entities, both are each driven by, by a, separate, a separate ambition. One is service, one is profit. They do not mix. You can only have one or the other. And uh, so we have to stay away from privatization. Thank you. John. John Mark. Oh, I'm really surprising myself, and I respect you very much, Bill. <laughs> I just want to touch on I don't believe that service and profit are separate entities. I am a firm believer that. Um, we have very strong um, local um, union workers that provide very, very uh, skilled work. And um, contracting out is about cutting costs, and often it ends up costing more to uh, city residents. So I just wanted to point that out. Thank you, Jenny. Did you want to respond, though? No, you're good. Okay, moving along. I think in Cambridge, we're a large enough city that uh, we don't really have to look at that privatization. We can afford to have people here. If you were a smaller municipality, to do everything becomes a bit of a challenge. But Campbell's is certainly large enough with the amount of people that we have and the amount of services that we provide that we should be able to do it in-house. There's no need to go outside. Um, obviously, as the issue came up, it's about cost savings. But I think if you're working together, with your employees, your union groups, your other stakeholders, to look at ways to be innovative for your cost efficiencies. There's no reason you have to go outside. I think we're all aware it's not just uh, within the city itself, but we have issues at the hospital, losing a laundry and things like that. Those are things that are jobs that are coming out of our community. That's gone on for a long time. Camels grows when we have people that are working, paying uh, you know others to do a service or a byproduct from them. It grows our community by having people here that are working. The diversity of services also grows our community, and I think that's something we need to look at in the future.
choice doesn't always mean that the price and other factors are thrown out the window. There's many factors that should go into decisions regarding the spending of tax dollars and how it affects our local economy. When we keep the money local, everybody benefits from that, from up above, down below, and I think everybody would succeed. Um, Hamilton needs a local business, lo needs local businesses that employ local workers at a fair living wage, and small changes can grow into big changes and make Hamilton even better and bigger. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I'll just personalize this a little bit. So I work with the school district. Um, so one issue we're having, and I think it's, it's across the board with contracting out. So uh, our trade staff, um, I had met with the director um, because often our HVAC systems or big uh, projects are contracted out. Uh, and the reason often is, oh, well, we can't afford to hire someone. Tell me where else it would come from then if we're gonna hire someone else. So. Um, that's the excuse. Uh, statistically, it is cheaper to have in-house labor uh, and get the quality. It's the people who know the, your city and these projects. So that's where I stand. Thank you. For example, her HVAC example, um, that requires a very specialized type of worker. If we can't hire that type of worker for our city, our only option may be to contract out in order to get the work done. But in terms of bigger projects like trash collection, um, we shouldn't be subsidizing the business's profits. That's asking the taxpayers to put money in someone else's pocket, and I don't think that's a fair uh, thing to ask of our taxpayers. Thank you. Thank you. Cheering next door and other dancing on the streets. So, <laughs> thank you, Councillor. <laughs> um, yes, I do support uh, contracting out when it's feasible. Um, this year, I, I had one of our citizens come up to me after Canada Day and told me that the pools were closed on Canada Day, and that was because uh, the city did not want to pay the staff double time to keep them open. So, might be a possibility to in investigate in the future. Um, the, for the, for the busiest days of the year, we're not getting the services out there. People only get the one day off, and if we, as a city, cannot afford to pay our employees to keep those uh, services open, something has to be done there. Uh, sole proprietor I am. Um, I work with unions. I do work for the unions. I do change their locks, too. Is there no union? They've asked me to unionize myself, me, myself, and I. <laughs> <laughs> might be a possibility, but, uh, but yes, I do support uh, when necessary, uh, public and private. Thank you. I see two challenges, three challenges. Awesome. This is getting fun now. Bill, then Stephen, then now. Bill Saran again, Cup W member for 30 years, uh, Union for Letter Carriers. Um, I'd like to disagree with Ray there. Um, those staff holidays those workers have are earned by union members. That's a day off that is in their collective agreement. When you start saying that you want to bring in a private person to look after a city pool, the liability issues are as strong, like they're out the roof. There's no way I would I would uh, agree with that. If if you look at the Coquilla Highway over the last 10 years, it's a perfect example of what privatization is at its worst. You've seen it every winter. We call them out. It's for profit. They'll only clear the roads when it's absolutely necessary. Because every time they put a truck on the road. The salt it uses cuts into its profit. So no privatization, no contract out for any city jobs. I think we stopped dancing. <laughs> yes, no, I, again, I, I disagree with that. Our citizens uh, need to have those services available every day of the year. Um, if we have to pay them overtime, uh, the, the budget should have had that in the budgets for the city to do that. So. Okay. Don't get too comfortable, Ray. You got two more challenges, Steve. I guess, from my perspective, the the idea of why we have days off, whether it's a family day, whether it's Canada Day, whether it's Remembrance Day, 
That's a day for family, that's a day for community, that's for people to be together. That is also have value. I think not having a swimming pool on maybe one or two days a year, that's not a big deal. We can do without for one of those two days. Let's let those people who are working there have time with their family. Uh, I think we've gone downhill since we've got this 24-7 mentality of commerce. We've gone away from family values and that's also where our unions are at. Let's get that value back. Yeah. Sorry, I uh, disagree with that as well, but uh, a lot of us in the private sector do work seven days a week. I work seven days a week, mostly because of the crime that's in the uh, city at this time too, which I will be addressing in the future if I become a councillor. Um, yes, our, uh, our marginalized people that uh, do only get the days off on uh, staff holidays like that need to spend time with their families and use those services that we have. Thank you. Okay, thank you, And Nancy on the challenge. Thanks. Nice. Um, buses run on Canada Day, so those workers are getting more than a regular wage, double or more. Um, the city has decided that the service is important. Um, if enough, if the pools should be open, then we pay the wage that's in the contract. So if people want pools open on Canada Day, then that's what should happen. Um, we want buses on Canada Day, we pay the wage. Thanks. Hi again, my name is Mike McKenzie, I'm back at the mic. Um, the, the big thing, I want to touch on a couple of things. The quick part is I'm running a zero waste campaign. I'd like to recycle this paper at the end of the night. And with that being said, like we look at the recycling in the city, like we can move towards that as a reality. So it's been mentioned and I just want to say that. Like, coming from a perspective of wanting to run for mayor, there's clearly a lot of different opinions and voices in the room, and I wouldn't want to be in the position of being against any one of you if you have a valid point, or if you feel that your points are valid. Like, I can't judge or decide who you are or what you're gonna do or what's important to you. You bring these issues forward for a reason. So if we're talking about why, when, and where, like, let's talk about that as a group. I need to understand what's going on, I need to understand the question at hand. I need to understand the people who have the experience and have put in the time over the past 25 years or longer and understand what works in the city and what doesn't. I just can't make a decision on the spot and I'm willing to learn and listen. So that's something that's important to me moving forward. So. Okay, Nancy, challenge. This is a subject near and dear to my heart. Um, my last job, I worked as a peace, a peace officer out at Sunbeaks. And at the end of uh, that term, I was refused my 4% vacation leave. After raising it to two levels of management, I was basically told to go away. And this was after I pointed out the, uh, the, the law, which uh, requires that as a minimum standard. And I also pointed out that I'm an arbitrator and I'm very much used to dealing with issues like this. So when it comes to privatization, Bill makes some good points. I don't think we have to look at it ideologically. I can cite examples of good infrastructure projects where unionized people have done an excellent job in Alberta with triple P, P projects and it's worked well. If you, if you want to camp on this uh, situation of recycling here, you know what, this council needs to work together better. It needs to get along, it needs to obey the law, it needs to respect collective bargaining, and it needs to resolve things and get results that are in the interest of the community of Kamloops, the workers of Kamloops, and, 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 and management. So, so I say to you, you know, uh, don't simply dismiss it or drop kick this notion of privatization. If we build a $120 million art center, convention center, there will be unionized Hi. workers on that site. And they will be providing quality work at competitive prices. All right, we have a challenge. Leslie. 
And uh, just, just partly in, in response to some of the things you said, um, the question is about contracting out existing services. It's not about bringing in new contracts or building new buildings. So I think if we're looking at new projects that the city does not have the capacity for, we can certainly look at bringing contractors in, hopefully local contractors, at livable wages, at union wages, with working conditions that are favorable. But if we're talking about existing services, then no, those do not need to be contracted. Thank you. Let's, let's talk internal. Let's talk bylaws. Let's talk the services that are presently given there. There should be union people who are giving quality service and who do not have to worry about privatization. So I, I say basically, you know, let those managers lead and let them be paid what is competitive. If you look at the wages for the managers and the number of managers in the city right now, I'd love to get my hands on it and tune up that organization. I'll do it if you let me. It's your turn. It's okay, Kevin, but it's my turn to talk about it. I kind of lose my way in your procedure. Okay, you're the only one who's losing your way, but that's okay. <laughs> do you support? The contracting out of municipal services, why, when, or why not? I certainly think that there are many situations where that's appropriate. I wonder if anybody in this room doesn't employ services privately, whether it's someone to look after your garden, whether it's somebody to mow your lawn, whether it's somebody to clean your house. And uh, if, if the question is whether, as a city council member, I think that we should absolutely have staff on board with us to do everything the city requires. They have to know. There's only one challenge per round. Any other challenge? I might have missed it. No? Okay. situations where public services have been contracted out and the results have been deplorable. Somebody mentioned the highways before. I, th I think that's something that everyone understands. Every winter we see that since those services have been contracted out, the service levels have really, really decreased. But there's something else interesting about contracting out. The regional district of Nanaimo recently did what they called an operational and efficiency review. Basically, they were looking to see how, as a regional district, as a local government, they could provide services better and more cost-effectively. And do you know what they did? In a couple of departments, they brought services in to the regional district. So I think that there's a real opportunity for cost savings 
by ensuring that we can do things right on the local level. And I can see very few circumstances where contracting out would be at all acceptable. Thank you. sitting here a year from now and saying to you, shucks, we'll do another study on that. I want to basically have the municipal government, Kamloops leaders here, take action Time. To, to, to not lessen their, to, to, to adjust and define better the core services. Thanks. Thanks, John. To you, Leslie. Thank you. So, in the case of the regional district of Nanaimo, it was not a core services review and was specifically not because of the way core service reviews are conducted. It was intended to be a very different process and they acted on the recommendations. They made change, not a single employee lost their job and they found cost efficiencies. So I think that there are opportunities for more efficient services or doing things better when you do it from the ground up, when you listen to the workers, this isn't about a plan, this is about implementation. And I'd like to see that in cameras too. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. This is in regards to my brother Bill bringing up uh, services on the Coquihalla as well. As Mr. Lax. Um, they are a private contractor, but uh, many of you read in the paper constantly about how poor the snow removal is in the city, and I believe that is union as well, so it doesn't matter if it's union or non-union, um, I think it uh, comes down to management, so thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you for a challenge. Thank you for a challenge. In the case of the city, I think it's a simple case of not allocating enough budget for the snow removal, not a matter of the workers not doing their jobs. So if we budget for the appropriate service, then we can get the correct services done and serve the citizens. Thank you. want to back it up by adding one really crucial piece of information that was in there. One of the things that the, the Nanaimo Regional District decided to do was to involve CUPE in the review. Uh, CUPE was included as a full partner, and so was the public. They actually went to the public and requested uh, input from them. So when, when we say this isn't your standard core review, it, it wasn't, and it's right not to call it a core review when you can invite all members to the table as active participants. So there is a difference there. Thank you. Thank you. To respond. You're good? Okay. And you're okay. He said what he needed to say. All right. Uh, who's next? Where are we? Kathy Sinclair running for City Council. I want to go back to where we started with Bill, Bill McQuarrie's point that business, government services are not business. It doesn't mean that government services can't run efficiently and have business-like qualities and be smart about it, but we deserve, all people deserve basic services and that includes healthcare. Privatization is a very slippery slope. Um, we only need to look to our neighbors to the south to see what's happening when you try to run a country like a business. Government needs to be providing a business, and um, I, I saw earlier today Greyhound is going to be cutting routes north as well. Um, that's not an effective way to move people around. People deserve accessible transportation, and um, yeah, we need to support the city and not privatize out. Uh, 
Hi. <clears throat> I think everyone in the room here knows the Owl Road dump. And that dump was a private dump. The city actually bought it because it was horrendous. And the city had no control over how it was operated. Um, the city made the decision to buy it because <clears throat> what's important for public interest is not just the bottom line. When I was on council before, I was a member of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities which represents 2,200 municipalities across the country. The FCM is opposed to P3s, public-private partnerships, because the benefit goes to the private company and the risk goes to the public. So when we're providing services in the city, we have to remember that the people in this room are the people that need to benefit from those services. Not shareholders, not uh, corporate uh, interests. When we look at uh, certain things, we do have to buy contract out. The latest, the report for Ajax was from a, a mining environmental company. There's no way the city of Kamloops would have that expertise. But for water, we don't want that privatized. Garbage, we don't want that privatized. Snow removal, and so on. Thanks. Thank you. Bill Sarai, uh, Letter Carrier Union, 30 years. I want to tell you, I'm, I'm standing up for City Council. If you look back at this recycling program that just got implemented, it even the rollout on it from the city was just horrendous. Most of the public wasn't even aware what was going to be picked up, what wasn't allowed no more, what you could do. They were coming to your garbage can, city staff was on company time, city taxpayer time, coming to your recycling box, opening up your lid, and looking through what you threw in there and tagging it and telling you that you did something wrong. You didn't know that until you came home and you saw that your bin hadn't been picked up. So they saved a million dollars on this 10 year, I believe, contract with this new provider. So the only two things that don't make money in recycling are glass and plastic. And guess what this guy doesn't have to pick up? Glass and plastic. So what, do, what happens to the average householder? Campus this week did a poll. The, the majority of people now are throwing those two items in the garbage that's going to the dump in the city of Campus. So when we say we saved a million dollars, did we really? We're, we ruined our environment even more now. We didn't help the public, we didn't help the average homeowner recycle. We made it more difficult for them, and in making it more difficult, they found an easy way out and put that stuff in a garbage can. Not everybody has a car to take it to General Grants. Keep the Ord Road, the Ord Road recycling and one in the east corner of the city, and let us take it there if we have to, but stop right. sending it to the city dump. Right. city being contracted out. That spells nothing but horror for the people who are using those services. When it comes down to something like the curbside recycling program, that was a short-sighted move. That was a move made for profit, not for your own interest. And when you consider what's going to happen now is all that waste or all of that recyclable waste is going to go straight to the landfill. People are going to spend their time, their money, and their effort to go to general grants to waste their gas money and to you know, waste their time throwing it in the, in the whatever general grants has for a pit. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so when it comes down to public-private partnerships, yes, we can see 
what's happening. I honestly think when we approach new ideas, we can maybe do it on a case by case basis, but we do have to look at the specifics of how they treat their employees and how um, they go about their work. If it's worth the money, and honestly, but we need to remember that the taxpayer, taxpayer accountability is much more central to a city who is doing the job themselves. Thank you. It's a great opportunity for clarification of your questionnaire. That was excellent. Well done. Fred. I did the questionnaire. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Brad Searle, and just like half the people in Kamloops, I too am running for council. Um, it's true. So, I have a question for you. The firefighters who were fighting fires this summer, heroes, right? Yeah, keep our boys safe, get them out, get them doing stuff. Um, I had the privilege of seeing a new startup uh, that has uh, opened in Kamloops, um, something called Hummingbird Drones. Is anybody familiar with Hummingbird Drones? Yeah, they do fantastic stuff. It's some young guys who have these little tiny drones who go and they've got thermal cameras on the drones and they can spend way more time above the fires. Um, they can fly later at night, earlier in the morning. They burn far, fuel fossil, uh, far fewer fossil fuels. I'm an English teacher, so I can use that as a tongue twister tomorrow. Um, to provide these services and they keep firefighters safe. I don't know how many lives they may have saved this summer, but with the fires that we had this summer, that organization really helped to drive the technology forward to make it safer for everybody and to make it more economical for the taxpayer to um, have those services provided. So in cases like that, where we have highly specialized, highly innovative, companies that treat their employees ethically, that pay them well, although as a startup, I believe they pay each other in boxes of KD. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they're moving on. Um, that those kinds of cases, absolutely, I support um, privatization of key services. But for services where if it's not broke, you don't need to fix it, like saving a million dollars over 10 years for recycling, I just don't see the benefit for everybody. Thank you. privatization as it is today. I work for BC Hydro. I am not a lazy government employee. I have witnessed the negative impacts to ratepayer of privatization and contracting out. I see the need in the sound public union business to hire contractors for peaks so we don't have to lay off our valleys. A lot of privatized services that depend on to get power to the people are there to make money for the contract holders, not serve the people of BC like a lot of hard-working unionized members do every day that want to keep rates low for you. Remember, he sets the rates. When it comes to government, here is the problem as I see it. Government doesn't run their services efficiently enough, hence the plausible business case for contracting out. As an operations manager and a former union employee, I strongly believe I am your guide to treat people right while making Kamloops able to serve businesses and people better with a realistic and collaborative approach. I got in our time. Got 30 seconds. <laughs> I'm done, because I didn't think I was going to get it done. <laughs> John, I'm adding on to it just to say to what was said about sometimes it's the contractor gets more money than the actual person who is like doing the work on the streets. I just want to give you a quick example. You know, there's a there's a few companies out there that I've worked for in the past where the guy that owns the company is living in the house up at Juniper Ridge. It's a multi-million dollar home and, and the contract company is coming off the front front lawn. And the people like myself who were out working long hours were getting paid the minimum wage possible. So I just want to tell you that I am absolutely for making sure that things are fair. Thank you everyone. That actually uh, works out perfectly for timing. Uh, thank you all for those, uh, those answers. And I was remiss earlier to, to mention that there were candidates that submitted questionnaires, and, and John did remind me, uh, that submitted questionnaires but weren't able to make it tonight due to family obligations or otherwise. I just want to you know, give a shout out to Gerald Watson, Todd McLeod, 
Sadie Hunter and Glenn Hilke for doing that. So they are part of the process tonight and we really appreciate them. So this is our opportunity for a closing comment by everyone. Uh, and what we'd like you to tell us in one minute or less, why are you seeking endorsement from the Kellenson District Labor Council? I'm going to start with Jim. <laughs> well, you forgot where he was. Because I like you. <laughs> for too long. I've seen that people don't get to be heard. And the biggest issue that I face in, indi in an Indigenous community and here in Kamloops is that when you're in a minority group or when you're on the outside looking in, your, your opinion really isn't valued or valued, valid or valued, unless you are right in the middle of, of usually some big empire of people who built everything. Like, I'm okay with where we're at today, but I want to see it better in 75 years. So I've put my name forward to represent a person who's able to bring all the voices together. I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to judge any of the voices that are here. I challenged John only because he was the last one. And I wanted to say something because the fact of the matter is what's fair and just is important to all of us. And I want to help be that voice. So that's who I am and that's why I'm here. Thank you. imaginary points not once but twice nailing the time right on <laughs> all right moving on ready right. i didn't have a challenge on that did you did not <laughs> not yet <laughs> Um, I seek your support because I believe that public and private can work together. Uh, I've proven that before as well. And I am president of the Multicultural Society and I deal with people from all walks of life as well as all as union and non-union too, and together, our motto is together, we can grow stronger. So, thank you. Okay, we have a challenge. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ashley. No, he's not good. He's teasing us. <laughs> thank you. Ashley, Heidi. So, I've heard a lot of people talk about um, privatization and not privatization, but we forget about the other things that unions do. They're not just about making sure that workers get a fair wage, they're making sure that workers are treated fairly in all aspects of life. Um, and as someone who knows discrimination, who has been through it, I understand that unions have been at the forefront of the battle for equal rights for many different people for many years. So I'm seeking their endorsement because I believe in equality for everybody, and I think that unions are central to that, and I've always led the fight, and thank you. Thank you. Mark. Uh, my greatest asset um, is I, I value everyone's opinion and I'm um, empathetic to people. Uh, I believe in equity, um, not just equality. And I'm going to not apologize. <laughs> but uh, I want, there's power in, um, behind people. And I'm a proud member of KDLC and a proud member of QB. And uh, there is power in voice, and I want to be bring that voice to the table. Thank you. Crazy. I grew up with a family where my dad worked. He owned his own business, and I know how much he struggled to put food on our table. We didn't have dental. We didn't have any extended benefits. I was fortunate enough to marry into a family that is union, and I have seen the benefits of everything that they offer, and the support, and also making sure that all the workers are safe. Thank you. <laughs> Jennifer Adams, and I am running for council. I'm going to echo some of the things that you said, because um, 
they could be words out of my own mouth. So why I am seeking an endorsement from you here and from your members and your friends and your family <laughs> is that um, I am a progressive voice for working people. I've never been in a union, but I've had my own companies. And when I did have my own company, I did try to, uh, actually I did pay much larger wages. I also had uh, an employee buy program worked into my incorporated company. I had a corporate daycare. So I was a small business person that basically took the example of the union and implemented it into the small business. And I truly believe that that is what we need to do with small business, we need to do it with our city. And uh, the municipality has a lot of, um, not power over provincial things, but we have the power to set the example in our own community to meet those goals of ending poverty, making it more equitable, fair working conditions, and all the things that the union is very uh, good at and should be very proud of. So, thank you. Stephen Carpuck, um, running for city council. So, I guess. You know, specific to the Labor Council and the trade unions and things like that, I'd love to have your vote, uh, as I'm sure everyone else behind me would as well. Um, why I would hope someone would endorse somebody like myself, uh, I believe in being open-minded. I believe in people have a genuine desire to live in a healthy, active, and I think with that comes a prosperous community like Kellams. Um, and I think working together as we all can win working together rather than having an us and them mentality, being open to ideas, innovations, uh, I think we can find a solution to most challenges that we're presented with. Um, I've had lots of opportunity to do that, and I look forward to doing more of that in the future. So I ask for your vote, um, if you're willing to give it, to consideration, um, and, and all the other people up here. Um, thanks for the opportunity tonight, thank you. Fewer fossil fuels. I <laughs> see. <laughs> Again, a liberation. Another imaginary point. <laughs> what I, the reason I seek your endorsement, your support, and your vote uh, for mayor is because we share similar goals, a lot of similar goals. Some of the, the basic and simple ones are a healthy community, a well adjusted community, a thriving community. We're about common sense, um, we're not adversarial. We're we're about coming, coming together for solutions, and I think we can do it. We have a, a very unique opportunity in this by-election coming up where you have an opportunity to change the balance of the table, uh, the city hall table, and, and you should take advantage of, of making those changes so that all sides are, are equally represented for once. It would be nice to see. And I'm Bill McCrory, I'm running for mayor, and I hope I have your support. Thank you. Freestyle this time. Um, <laughs> I want your support because you are the people, and I want to represent the people. And I want some speaking lessons and leadership lessons from young Mike there. Um, but I have been a non-union, minimum wage, pretty much close to legalized slave labor, as I like to call it. I've been a union employee, and I'm a manager that reviews every time she diligently to make sure union members are getting what they want, but also making sure there aren't ones taking advantage of everything union, the labor movement work for that gives it that negative connotation from the other side. So I'd like to think of myself as a very well-balanced person that cares about people and knows how to run a business, and I think a lot of workers who I'd like to listen to, even though I'm a manager, would understand. I really believe I can truly represent you, and I hope you give me the opportunity. Thanks. Hello, everybody. Uh, Brad Searle, and I'm running for City Council. Um, the reason why I think that I deserve the vote of your organization is because not only do I come from a family where both my parents were teachers and part of the BCTF, um, and my younger brother is a nurse, 
But for 12 years, I lived overseas. I was teaching in South Korea. And we were um, explicitly not allowed to form a union. We were not allowed to collectively bargain. And the Minister of Justice uh, banned all gatherings of English teachers uh, to even uh, talk about starting a union. So I know how difficult it is to not feel that your voice is being heard and that you don't have any kind of recourse if your boss isn't treating you fairly. Um, and my name is Brad Searle, and I hope I get your vote. Thank you.
Hello, County St. Clair. Um, and as your city councilor, I'm seeking your future city councilor, I'm seeking your endorsement um, because I want to serve the people and I listen and I want to hear what you have to say. You have a very powerful um, group here in representation and we need to extend this. Um, part of my platform is social sustainability. Sustainability, um, people think environmental a lot of the time, but the social piece is huge and that's what KDLC does. Equity, diversity, and human rights. Um, I'm not a believer in top-down management. I want to hear what you have to say and I'm going to take that to the council table. Thank you. My name is Leslie Knox. I want your vote because you count. You really do. We want a fair, a safe, and livable community where everybody's work is valued. I'm not a union member, but I've worked for unions. In the late 70s, early 80s, I was helping organize for the South African National Union of Mine Workers at a time when union organization wasn't simply a matter of talking to management. So I understand unions. I've done research for unions over the course of my career. Without unions, without collective bargaining, working conditions that we have today. But I want your support because unions are leaders. You're not only leaders in terms of working conditions, but you're leaders in terms of social conditions and social issues. And I think as that leadership is something I can learn from and reflect back at the council table. Thank you very much. Step up as a candidate, and I know how hard you, all of you are working. 
Uh, and that's why I have no problem granting a little bit of leniency, a little, little bit of public shame. That's all right. <laughs> uh, because like, I know how busy your lives are right now. Uh, and so thank you so much for your very thoughtful, and some of them were incredibly informative answers. There was stuff here tonight that I didn't know, and I was very, very happy to learn. Thank all of you for coming out tonight and participating in this process. I hope you got something out of it. We will be posting the video and uh, our press release onto the KDLC website, which is kdlc.ca. So be on the lookout for that over the next few days. And uh, thanks everyone for coming out. And John just wants to challenge me, I think. I don't know. <laughs> 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 well, I'm going to challenge them. Challenge them? Okay, that's an interesting thing. Right. Challenge them how? <laughs> to vote. <laughs> <laughs> to vote. <laughs> All right, everybody get out to vote. vote. That, that's part of one. Can I please just have 30 seconds? We use it all night. We, Democratic. Can we all get 30 seconds? <laughs> <laughs> all those in favor of giving the gentleman 30 seconds. Say aye. All those opposed, say nay. The nay's out. And I want to also say that every single person who responded to the questionnaire, and I'm sure those of you who are here uh, would and, you know, be part of this sentiment, Every one of them said that they would continue an ongoing conversation with the Council and District Labor Council going forward. And that means a lot to us. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you.